Hello? Hey, Rich, it's Larson. You got a minute? Sure, Larson. What's up? Hello, good morning, or afternoon, or evening, wherever, whatever time it is, wherever you are. It is uh, Larson Hicks. I'm joined by Pastor Rich Lusk, and we are here today on the Got a Minute podcast talking about this quote uh, and this conversation that I've seen kind of raging on the internet over the last couple weeks, months, uh, it pops up every now and then. But uh, I'll, I'll read the quote from Kevin DeYoung. It was, uh, and this is the quote from uh, Twitter. Uh, a couple. So this was this was a while back. This is a couple of years ago, actually. But there's been a recent sort of rehash of all this stuff. And he said, and this is on. Uh, this is like 20, 2018 sometime. One of the acceptable idolatries among evangelical Christians is the idolatry of the family. And so uh, here we go. Um, and, and this has been uh, debated and hashed out and rehashed out a couple different times, um, but seems to be something people are revisiting and rethinking about. And I think people in our circles are really reacting, maybe even overreacting to this conversation, Rich, um, where, uh, where it, it, it seems like we, we only want to see that um, what they're doing there is, is foolish and uh, – and I, it certainly is on a lot of levels, but but there's is, is there any merit to this whole uh, this whole thing, this whole idea of idol, making the family into an idol? Yeah, Larson, great to be with you today. Uh, yeah, hey, this this is I'm I'm not real active on social media. People that know me yeah. well know that I'm not a real avid social media guy. But this is something that I feel like every time I've uh, I, I've gotten on social media uh, recently, it seems like there's some kind there's some um, permutation of this conversation about the family, family idolatry, natural affections, uh, all of this. So let me let me lay out what I think is happening. And, then, and that'll kind of, I think, provide context because uh, I'm, I'm really a Kevin DeYoung fan. Yeah, uh, sure. And I think there's a lot of truth in his in his tweet. I've seen a lot of people attack his tweet that I'm, you know, very closely connected with it. So I want to see if I can... Um, I think this is a complex issue. So let me just lay out kind of what I think is, is sort of in the big picture is going on. Okay. The culture in general, and especially the so-called globalist elites who sort of run things and dominate the culture today, very clearly believe that we are in a post-familial age, part of being a post-Christian age. And of course, I'm, that's not the way I would actually describe it, but that's the way a lot of people talk about it. A post-Christian age is a post-family age too. And uh, so you see a lot of anti-marriage sentiment in our culture, right. a lot of anti-child sentiment. Uh, people will tout the benefits of a single life or a child-free life that constantly gets attention. And the, the, again, the global elites seem to very much be on board with that in terms of their rhetoric and their policies and, and whatnot. Then you've got Big Eva, kind of the evangelical industrial complex, the, the big evangelical celebrities who always seem to be aping whatever's happening in the world. You know, they're kind of one step behind. They are the right. shadow that follows the, you know, the, the this... Um, you know, sort of the elites within culture. And, yeah. uh, and so they also tout, a, a, you know, the single life. I think there's a big misunderstanding about what Paul means when he talks about singleness in 1 Corinthians 7, but you'll hear a lot of talk about singleness as a gift. You'll hear a lot of warnings about how you can make an idol out of the family. You can make an idol out of uh, marriage. You sure. can make an idol out of motherhood. Just the other day, Crossway had an article on their blog about, you know, are we making an idol out of motherhood for women? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and then you've got conservative evangelicals, and that would include conservative reformed evangelicals who, who, who come along and push back against all of that. And they say, you know, the family is not being turned into an idol uh, in our day. Uh, and you see that because marriage rates are plummeting, birth rates are plummeting. It's not that people are too consumed with family, it's that they have become anti-family. And that means they're anti-God's purposes for humanity. Because you go back to Genesis 1, God says to be fruitful and multiply. God marries the man and the woman in the garden. And obviously they begin having children and, and building a household and, and, and a life together, a little kingdom. And that's God's plan for the human race. And uh, certainly there can be exceptions to that, but that's, that's what's normative. And so we ought to be stressing what is normative. And, uh, and, and from these folks, you'll get a lot of talk about the importance of natural affections, that if we have rightly ordered affections, we're going to love our country and love our family. And, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. 
and uh, they they want to dismiss the warnings of idolatry and and a lot and, right. and I will say I am very very sympathetic with where they're coming from. In fact, that's overall where I'm coming from as well. Uh, but uh, I, I think there is truth in Kevin DeYoung's tweet. I do think it is possible for the family to be made into an idol. And what I'd like to do is talk about some of the ways in which the family can become an idol. But they may be ways that we haven't really thought about. And they don't yeah. come just from the right. They actually come from the left. And in fact, I think in some cases, you mm -hmm. see it uh, among those globalists. I, I think that's interesting. And I do think there's there's a, a, lot, a lot to talk about here because... Um, you know, I, I I'm quick to uh, I'm very quick to be critical of of the left and of folks in uh, in those kind of left leaning um, circles, and and I think I know what they're doing, and and I don't like it. So I'm 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 uh, you know I'm, I want to stand against that the the lies there and the the plays they're trying to run there. But but I I too in in our circles I do see some things uh, with respect to how we view the family. Um, over against you know the authority of the church or the authority of the state um, that I do think is is uh, is troublesome. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive into it. Um, and and maybe I don't know if you want to dive into the the scripture. You know uh, if if that's a good place to start. But but it seems like the arguments obviously, you know Jesus saying you know who are my mother and brothers uh, or, or saying if anyone wants to come to me he must hate his own father. Um, so it seems like you know, that that those are the verses that that uh, are used kind of um, to justify this argument. Um, against yeah, and I'll, 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 let me let me come back to that. Let me let yeah. me give some yeah. examples of, yeah. of ways in which I think the family can be seen as an idol in our day. You know, what, for one thing you got to ask is what does it mean for something to be an idol? I would say that anything in creation actually can become an idol if you expect from uh, from that created thing uh, something that only God can give. You know, right. if you uh, if you are trusting in that idol to provide things for you, you know whether it's happiness, fulfillment, what have you, uh, that, that that only God can give, uh, then you have made that thing into an idol. So, uh, you know, idolatry in the history of the church has generally been defined in terms of disordered loves. It's it's not mm -hmm. wrong, mm -hmm. obviously, to love your family, but you have to love your family in the right way. Or it's not wrong to love your country. You have to love your country in the in the right way. And it's possible to turn those things into idols by loving them in the wrong way. And so, you know, again, I've seen from conservative Christians, a, a lot of talk about natural affections, but even natural affections in a fallen world can uh, be expressed in unnatural ways or, or sinful ways or idolatrous ways. So let me just give an example. And this is, this is yeah. like, if, you know, um, I thought about, you know, Gospel Coalition is a, is a website that obviously has pushed a lot of this sort of post-familial way of thinking right. uh, on Christians over the last several years. They'll trot out articles every now and then about how, how great the single life is, singleness as a right. gift kind of thing, or they right. will trot out something on, you know, warning about idolizing marriage or idolizing children, that kind of thing. And, yeah. and usually those articles have a few good thoughts mixed in with a lot of really, you know, bad thinking. Um, but uh, I was thinking if I were going to submit an article to uh, the Gospel Coalition, I might do something like this, write an article on how, yes, the family can be made into an idol. And for Exhibit A, I would use Joe and Hunter Biden because yeah. I think Joe Biden has made an idol out of Hunter. The problem oh. with Joe Biden's relationship with Hunter is not a lack of natural affection. He checks all the natural affection boxes, sure. but he loves Hunter Biden in such a way that he's putting – the well-being of our nation at risk because mm -hmm. obviously Hunter Biden is a bad person, done a lot of bad things, involved in all yeah. kinds of uh, political corruption and sexual corruption. And of course, now we know the whole thing about Hunter Biden's laptop. I mean, that story even, right. the fact that it was covered up. I mean, is that not idolatry? Why isn't totally. anybody exposing that? I think actually what you have with the globalists and, and see a lot of times the way the debate is structured, it is the globalist elite who supposedly despise the family versus the conservative Christians who want to, uh, you know, talk about how important the family is. And, and, and to some degree that's true. But when I look at how our globalist elites actually live, they do love their own families. Jesus said, even the pagans will look out for their own. And, and I think you yeah. see that. So Hunter Joe Biden, I take that as exhibit a of how, how the family can become an idol. I mean, just right. another example of this from the political left uh, I don't think Nancy Pelosi's husband all of a sudden got really good at picking stocks. You know, there's lots of speculation about insider 
you know, trading sure. information passed on and that kind of thing. Because how do these people go off to Washington, right. people who have a relatively modest means, and then right. in just five or 10 years, and no they're business just, experience. Yeah. They've got incredible wealth. Well, obviously right. something's going on. And, and again, they're looking out for their own. I even yeah. think immigration policy, you know, a lot of conservatives say, oh, having open borders is anti-family because it destroys America, the American workforce and 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 you know they take jobs and all of that and I, there's a lot of truth in those kind of criticisms i mean the immigration laws we have were passed for a reason they ought to be enforced but when globalists like biden or pelosi uh basically disregard immigration laws i don't think it's because they're anti-family i just think they're looking out for their own family instead of my family or your family mm. immigrate immigrants provide cheap labor for them uh, you know, so so their kids don't have to make their beds or cut the grass. They'll have cheap labor, do, you know, immigrant labor do it. Right. Uh, so so I, I think to just say, well, um, you know, the globalists are anti-family. No, the globalists are very much pro-family when it comes to their own. Mm. They may be anti everybody else's family, but they're looking out for their own. If anything, I would say the bigger problem in Washington, D.C., it's probably more like nepotism or right. some kind of turning a blind eye to things that my right. own family members do uh than it is just disregarding the family yeah there's the whole you know the the, the saying you know, blood is thicker than water um and and I've, I've heard you or or others in our circles talk about the idea that actually no water is 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 thicker than blood um the waters of baptism um are are a, a more um a more permanent a more powerful bond um and and i do think there's um there is a real um, you know, I, I think people struggle with the, the concept that I am going to love my children um, unconditionally, you know, that, that no matter what stupid choices they make, even if they apostatize, you know, I'm going to love my children. Um, how do I square that, you know, with, with the, the call I have as a Christian to, um, you know, fidelity to, to Christ and to the, his church and, um, you know, it, it, can, are those two things in conflict with each other? Am I am I able to do yeah. those two things simultaneously? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you know, one thing that we as as Reformed Christians are committed to is the uh, you know the, the the biblical teaching that grace restores nature, redemption restores the creation, and that includes the family. And so, right. for example, this is why you have. Uh, God's covenant promises, I will be a God to you and to your children. So if you think about it, if Adam and Eve had not fallen into sin and they began having children, uh, those children obviously would grow up in a faithful relationship, not only with their parents, they would grow up in a faithful relationship with God, their creator. Right. And, and they wouldn't need a conversion experience. There'd be no tension between, you know, say the, the this, the church as it exists in an unfallen world where they gather for worship and family, uh, the things that they do as a family, no tension at all there because everybody who's in your family is also part of, a, uh, of the church. There's no, there's, right. no, uh, there's no sin in the world. So obviously everybody is, is going to be a part of the church. Everybody's going to be part of the, of, of the family. And so those things go together perfectly, seamlessly. In a fallen world, uh, obviously, the sin rips families apart, and you see that immediately with Cain and Abel, how uh, Cain turns on Abel. And, uh, and, of course, you see it all throughout the scripture right. Right. where you have families that can be – they're united by blood, but they're divided spiritually. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're, they belong to the same family tree, the same family – entity, the same family grouping, but they're on opposite sides of the great spiritual war on opposite sides of the antithesis. And of course, mm -hmm. Jesus did talk about how the family can become a rival to his kingdom, a rival to the gospel. He said that the gospel will turn uh, mother against daughter and right. father against son. He, you know, he, right. he, 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 he gave us those as possibilities that sometimes the gospel will tear families apart if not everybody in a household responds to Jesus' message in the same way. Now, yeah. our hope still is that the family as a whole will be restored, and that's what we long to see and pray for and work for. And, of course, when we bring children into the world, Christian parents don't think that they're having kids just to populate hell. We fully expect our children to be with us in uh, in eternal glory, and we raise them accordingly. But right. sometimes children apostatize. Sometimes spouses apostatize. Uh, so sometimes there is this divide where family members find themselves on 
different sides of the great spiritual sure. battle. And we have to we have to reckon with that and to ignore that or override that mm-hmm. is to make an idol of the family. Yes. It's to put your family, loyalty to your family above loyalty to Christ. And of course, throughout the history of the world, maybe not so much in America today, uh, but throughout the history of the world, this has been a major issue among God's people is putting family first and family right. over God or family over church as the case may be. And so Jesus, yeah, there are a number of passages where Jesus identifies that as an issue. And I've seen this play out in a lot of different ways. I'll give you a couple examples of this. So I, I don't think I don't think the Gospel Coalition would accept my article in which I use Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's relationship as an example of family idolatry. They probably wouldn't go for that. Uh, they probably would be okay with these kinds of examples. Uh, so here's one. Um, parents are told to leave an inheritance to their children. Fully on board with that. Proverbs talks about that. That's a metaphor or an image that's used again and again in scripture spiritually. But uh, you know, clearly there's something good about an inheritance being passed on from yeah. one generation to the next. You want a spiritual legacy. You want to build household wealth and dominion. Those are all good things in and of themselves. But if you have a child who apostatizes, should you still be leaving a huge chunk mm-hmm. of your estate to that child when, in effect, you would be... Uh, funding someone who is now on the other side of that spiritual battle. I would say no. I would say uh, yeah. an inheritance is a free sure. gift, but it also there's a there's a conditional element to it. Yeah. My parents have this in their will uh, for myself and my brother. Uh, if, if we were to apostatize, we would not inherit what's there for us. I've got this in my will, you know, my wife and I do for our kids. Uh, so whatever we leave behind when we die, uh, in order to get it, they've got to be faithful Christians, members of faithful yeah. churches, all of that. And, and, and so here's an example where if you put kingdom first, you know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't seek first your family or your family. Seek first the kingdom of God. Then you're going to, uh, I think, uh, you're going to have certain um, requirements or conditions in place when it comes to who you leave your your, your wealth or your estate to. So that'd be an example. Um, and, and and that's one that I think could be talked about at greater length, exactly what that'll okay. look like. But I think it's it's an important uh, example. Well, I, th- I think um, th- there's there's so many different aspects of this that that uh, and and I'm I'd love to kind of go down a couple different rabbit trails. I mean, I, th- I think one of them that you touched on is, you know, there there is the – well, th- another form of idolatry of the family. I'll, I'll just give another example because I hear it all the time. Um, you, you get the workaholic dad, right, who who, who can't stop working, um, won't, won't spend time with his family. Um, and – and uh, but but he tells himself uh, and and his family, well, I'm doing it all for you. You know, I'm doing it all for you. I'm trying to leave you a better life. And so there's some sort of idolatry there, or at least an idolatry of of an inheritance, or an idolatry of you know of, of giving you know living the American dream, perhaps, and and leaving something better for my kids than I had growing up. Where uh, it's like, where you know, where do you get that, Dad? Like, where do you get that in Scripture that, that it's a commandment for you that you you must your kids must attend a better school than you did or or make more right. money than you did? You know, right. it's like right. um, that that's not in there. You know, um, and so he's kind of baptizing baptizing his his workaholic or his his abdication really of being present and being a father um, with with uh, with kind of. Uh, the family, uh, or the excuse of, of the family. And, and, and somehow that's acceptable in a lot of places. Um, I think you're right. I think that that's become an acceptable form of idolatry. And that's Mm -hmm. probably an idolatry, not just of say family, but also of material provision or material comfort. Obviously there's a balance there. Working hard to provide is a good thing, but again, like any other created thing, uh, that can be turned into an idol. Let, let me give you another example of this kind yeah. of family idolatry that I have seen play out more than once. And that is a, uh, a, a faithful Christian couple uh, will have a, you know, an older child, you know, teenage, you know, yeah. as a teenager or older, uh, come out of the closet, so to speak, and, sure. and, you know, say that I'm actually same sex attracted or I'm gay or, uh, or also go transgender. Yeah. And at that point, the parents have to make a decision. Who will they side with? Will they side mm-hmm. with 
what they've always believed about these things based on the teaching of the Bible, or will they side with their child? And more than once, I have seen parents side with their child and change their views on homosexuality or change oh. their views on transgenderism to, uh, to accommodate uh, their child and to maintain a relationship with their child. And, and when right. asked or challenged about it, they will say, well, I just, I, you know, I love my child so much. I, I can't bear the thought of being cut off from my child because of this decision they've made. Yep. And they'll, they'll, they'll rethink their whole theology, their whole outlook on something like homosexuality in order to preserve a relationship with their child. I've actually seen this happen with pastors. And I know yep. a number of situations where pastors, actually PCA pastors, where they've had a child come out of the closet or go in yep. a if not a full transgender direction, at least a, you know, very, um, yeah. well, we'll just say transgender. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and, and then, and they have gone soft. Maybe they have not completely capitulated, but they've gone soft on those issues. And if you ask the question, why do we have so many pastors who are part of, you know, say conservative faithful denominations who seem incapable of speaking out against these particular sins? I think this is a big reason why mm -hmm. they've got this kind of mm -hmm. sin in their own family and they don't want to deal with it. And again, yeah. I would say this is a form of idolizing the family. You put fa mm -hmm. you're seeking family above kingdom, and so you can't speak the truth. Right. Uh, and, and and you've compromised yourself on these things right. because you don't want to offend a family member. Well, your definition at the top of the of the conversation of idolatry as disordered loves, I think, really really brings that point home. If you've if you've somehow um, given family a status um, that that trumps your your loyalty to God and His Word, then of course you know that that's going to be the default. Um, so it really exposes where you know where your treasure is, where your where your heart is. Um, the the other one, uh, Rich, that I see is, and and I think we have to wrestle with this. You know, um, when when Christ said that that. Um, you know that you'd have to, you know, hate your family um, in order to follow him. Um, you know, he, he wasn't saying, and 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 now, you know, the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother goes out the window. Um, um, and and so, you know, he's he's speaking there, um, and, and he's saying something. Uh, and and I think this is the, you know, this is a whole other topic, but but it does seem that everything, every cultural debate, you know, within the church. Um, and in the culture c comes down to definitions. It comes down to hermeneutics. It comes down to how you, you know, how you interpret scripture. Um, I just saw a, uh, an, an old friend, you know, not really a friend, more of an acquaintance that I, I, uh, um, did a little bit of time with when I was doing missionary stuff with youth with a mission right after, right after high school. And uh, this guy is just full, full liberal, you know, full, you know, full liberal pastor, right? And he he puts out a, 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 a shares a a message on Facebook about how well the uh, the um, command, you know, the all the commandments against uh, sodomy are uh, over over are negated by scripture where where we're said that uh, in christ there's neither jew nor gentile nor male nor female and so Ooh. therefore you know therefore right right uh and it's just like what what kind of what kind of hermeneutical um gymnastics do you have to do you know to to, to start to justify these things but but yeah, the honor your father and mother yeah. thing i think is interesting uh right uh, yeah i think that's yeah. if you're if your parents apostatize you know uh what does that look like you know what does obedience to christ look like when your parents apostatize? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great question. Uh, obviously, there are still ways in which you can honor your, your father and mother, even while you disagree with them. It, but it will clearly change your relationship with them. And it might it, you know, not only change the way you interact with them, and you may have to have some hard conversations with them. It may sure. change the way in which you uh, open up your own kids to the influence of their grandparents. Uh, there are a lot of different things that can happen there. So. Um, the, I think the bottom line here is that there are all kinds of ways in which the family yeah. can become an idol. I think Kevin DeYoung's tweet is mm -hmm. right. I understand why there's so much pushback uh, against this kind of thing sure. in a, you know, again, in, in living in what people call a post familial age in which, you yeah. know, family life is greatly downplayed. Uh, I, you know, I see why there are people who, 
uh, want to push back and say, hey, the problem is not making an idol out of family. When marriage rates are plummeting and birth rates are plummeting, obviously the problem is not family idolatry. It's yeah. idolatry of something else. You know, Maybe we've made right. an idol out of the single life. Okay, right. That's happening too. But I still think there, there are ways in which family can become an idol. You, you, know, you, you gave some good examples there too. I'll give you a couple more and we can, we can wrap it up. But sure. um, you know, we probably are all familiar, say, with a young woman who really wants to get married. Mm -hmm. And then is pressured by her boyfriend, you know, say to uh, go past certain lines, you know, physically, sure. sexually, have sure. sleep with him. And she ends up compromising herself and actually marrying a man who's probably not good for her, who's a low character mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Uh, but because it's because she wants to be married so badly and she thinks this yeah. is this is the, the ticket. This is the way to do that. Yeah. Uh, or we've also seen, of course, um, parents who idolize their children. They sort of live vicariously through their children. And uh, they're so, so over the top concerned with the accomplishments of their children, their children having uh, comfortable lives, being happy all the time. They actually make an, an idol of their children in that kind of way. And, and, and ironically, what ends up happening with that when parents make an idol of their, of their children or their children's happiness is they actually end up putting so much pressure on their, their children that it strains the relationship. Anything we turn into an idol, ultimately we, we crush it, we destroy it. And if parents yeah. do that with their children, they can actually end up creating uh, a huge uh, mess in the relationship they have yeah. with their kids. I, I would also say things like um, children's sports. You know, yeah. the, there's obviously debates, you know, year after year over, you know, well, my kids got a little league game on Sunday that we'd have to miss church to go to. What do I do? Well, uh, again, I to me, the, the answer to that's pretty, pretty clear, pretty obvious. Seek first the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. uh, that means worship's going to take a priority over yeah. little league. And, uh, and, and one of the most important things that you can teach your kids is the priority of worshiping God, that worshiping God comes first, participating in the life of the church is a high priority. Uh, I would say that there, there are a lot of parents who make an idol of the family because they have prioritized kids little league or kids soccer tournaments yeah. over the worship of the triune God on or, a regular or family, basis. Or and family it, vacations, you know, like just frequent, you same know, thing. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. The, you know, another weird kind of, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about a few other examples. Uh, w one that I think is kind of interesting is, in, and it's more common in our circles, is is there is a particular view of child rearing, you know, or education uh, that, that may be held in your particular church community. And people can idolize that. Um, and, and, you know, Doug Wilson, one of my favorite, favorite, uh, um, things he says about child rearing is that if you're if your children are having trouble loving your standards then your standards may be too high you should lower mm -hmm. your standards um and 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 the idea i think he's making is the the greatest commandment is to love the lord thy god with all your heart soul mind and strength and so that's your it, as a father as a mother that's your mission you know like that's that's the work of discipleship that you're working you're you're you're, you're embarking on and if and if the the system of education or the school that you want them at that you think does the best job on paper, if it's not working and your kids hate it and they hate life in your home, then to hell with all of that stuff, right? Um, focus on the the mission field God's given you. Um, and I think this is this is a you know Jordan James Jordan's um, definition and discussion of idolatry and I, or, uh, of Gnosticism and I, and and, and uh, ideologies and and how our sort of um, obsession with systems and 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 kind of uh, you know distilling knowledge down to like the the most central thing. Everybody wants. We've talked about this, I'm sure, already on this podcast. But everybody wants. Just give me. Just give me a system. Give me a, right. a process. Right. Give me something I can right. follow. And and it's it's you talk about idolatry. Um, what are you wanting? You're begging for a, a a block of wood or stone or something that's dead. You know, something that that doesn't that that can't actually speak. You know, you want that to be the thing you. Um, you worship and serve and uh, and model your life after, um, and uh, and again, that's it's an idolatry. 
because uh, yeah. God gave you, yeah. you know, you are you are a, a man, and He gave you men and women, you know, in your family to uh, to to shepherd. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And I think a lot of times, you know, parents often are looking for a technique or yeah. a formula for yeah. child rearing instead of wisdom. Yeah. And you and I have actually talked about wisdom before, and yeah. I, and I think that that's a real mistake. I also think one way to tell where your idols are is to th- is to consider what are the things you are anxious about. Hmm. You know, I don't I don't remember who it was, but I remember somebody talking about a circle of control versus a circle of concern. And your circle of hmm. concern is always bigger than your circle of control. Your circle of control is what you maybe not sure. control might not be the right word, but at least those things where you have some Direct say, influence. you have agency yeah. in these areas, you can, yeah. you can exert some influence in what happens. And then your circle of concern, things you're concerned about, but obviously you, you know, you may not have any real say in what happens there. So I can be concerned about what happens in Ukraine, but I don't have any, any control right. or influence over it. Yeah. Uh, except we could say by prayer or something like that. But, sure. but uh, what, so, you know, when your circle of concern is a lot bigger than your circle of control, that's where anxiety starts to creep mm. in. Um, so I think one question Good. to ask, and this is a way of sort of diagn- you know, diagnosing your own idols is to ask, what are you anxious about? Where are your anxieties? What are the particular uh, stress points in your life or anxious points in your life and for anybody with kids, that's usually going to involve your kids in some way. And I'm not saying that all anxiety is due to sin. Paul talks about the concerns or anxieties he has over the churches, and I don't think that's a sinful kind of anxiety. I think it's a it's a it's a, it's a concern uh, about the, the the health and the well being sure. and future of those churches. And so there's there not not every form of concern in that way, what we might call anxiety, is necessarily sinful. Right. But generally speaking, anxiety is a sin. Right. And I, anxiety, if we, if we will follow our anxieties to their source, we will oftentimes uncover what our idols are. If I'm really anxious yeah. about how the stock market is doing, it might be because I have made an idol out of financial security. Or if I'm right. really, really anxious about my child's success in this or that endeavor, it might be that I've made an idol out of that. Well, I, uh, I, and, I, and just so to interrupt, just, I, I think I think that's dead on, and I think one way to look at it, just to take your your um, your sort of process of identifying your idols uh, to the next step, it's it's what are you worried about, and then what are you doing about it, right? You know, right, you know right. Scripture commands us to cast our cares upon the Lord. So if if you are taking them to the Lord and casting them on Him. Then, then, uh, then you're 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 dealing with it biblically. You're dealing with it like a Christian. Um, but when when uh, you start frantically looking for ways to double down on your system or or, or whatever, then then you're um, then then you're obviously you're right. That that is that is clearly crossed into a idolatrous um, territory. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That that is exactly right. Hey, Rich. One last question, and and uh, before maybe we wrap this up, if if uh, on this topic of idolatry in the family, uh, the thing that I see in our circles um, that's more common is a real um, confusion or even abandonment of uh, I think the reformed concept of, of sphere sovereignty, you know, and mm-hmm. and and the, the right role of the family and the church and the state, and the, and and that those each have legitimate. Um, authority and um, and I think what what I see more often than not are families who who just really want to usurp um, they, they want to they want to cast off government they want to cast off church um, uh, and uh, and what they're left with is well it's sh- it's really just me the patriarch and my family and 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 nobody. Uh, nobody else has any right or authority to to tell me what to do. Uh, that that yeah. seems like a, a a a clear area of idolatry of the family in in our circles that I see. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, and this is a good way to wrap things up because I was going to mention a couple things that I've written on this. If if people are interested in pursuing this further, one is a book uh, that I did with Randy Booth. I think Yuri Brito did the foreword to it. It's called The Church Friendly Family. You know, we always talk about oh, yeah. the need for family friendly churches, and certainly yeah. that's true. But but what about the church friendly family? What about the family that mm. that recognizes and submits to that's the good. church? And and I think that's really, really crucial. And so in that book we try to you know, you mentioned sphere sovereignty. God has yeah. established different institutions or different governments in the world, and they each have their own 
sphere, their own domain, their own role. And of course, when one sphere tries to take on the uh, tasks, tasks or functions of another sphere, you, you, get, you get into a lot of trouble. Or when one yeah. sphere abdicates and doesn't perform the functions that it should, you get into trouble. So the, the way it's usually put is that uh, God has established a family government, uh, mm-hmm. which has the rod, uh, church government, which has the keys, and civil government, which has the sword, and each one of those instruments basically defines what the what the role of that particular government is. Mm-hmm. So, for the family, it's obviously you know, raising children in the context of of marriage. With the church, it is the mission of the church, opening the kingdom, and the discipline of the church, shutting mm-hmm. the kingdom out to to the unrepentant. Uh, and of course, the the sword of the state to maintain justice, law, and order. Uh, in civil society. So you've got these different governments, and obviously if the family abandons its role and is no longer disciplining and shepherding children, then it's going to be up, then the church and, and state are going to have to step in and do something about yeah. these kids when they grow up and become, yeah. you know, terrors, menaces to society. Uh, sure. Or if the church doesn't do its job, then obviously the other governments will flounder because the church is called upon to disciple these other spheres and to train mm-hmm. them in what God's word has to say about their, their respective domains. So the church trains fathers in household governance and what it means to be a faithful patriarch and how you lead your home. Or uh, the church in, 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 a, in a general kind of way, a broad kind of way, trains the magistrate in his obligations. You know, just discipling Caesar, teaching Caesar what God requires of him, what he can and can't do. Uh, and so forth. So, uh, so you have these different governments God has instituted. These different governments God has ordained, and 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 each one for the the key to a healthy and well functioning society is each one of these governments mm-hmm. doing its task, yeah. uh, and also recognizing the boundaries or limits that God has put on it. And and actually, at the foundation of all of this, you could say, really, you've, you've got these three different governments. The foundation of it all, perhaps, is self-government, where you learn to practice self-control right. and and self-discipline in your own life, and that that's really really crucial as well. So, yes, and and any one of these spheres can become an idol. I mean, you know, we could talk about how the church, you know, can make an idol of itself, and and the church sure. can, you know, I mean, I think you see when churches go liberal, this is what they're doing. The church decides. We'll disregard God's word, and we'll we'll make our own pronouncements and treat our word as as authoritative. And uh, I mean, it's just following the lie of the serpent in the garden, uh, so that you know you, the church can even become you know a rival to the kingdom in a way. Sure. But uh, when each one of these spheres functions as it should, you have a manifestation of the kingdom of God, uh, mm-hmm. because these 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 governments were ordained by God uh, to reflect His own rule. Uh, in different areas or different zones of life, but when these different spheres get out of out of line, out of whack, when they encroach upon one another, basically when I, when they're infected with some kind of idolatry, things in society go haywire. And of course, that's very much what we're seeing around us today. So we, we Randy and I, we actually spoke at a conference together. Uh, the the church friendly family was the theme of that conference, and and the book deals with with more than just the family church relationship. But that's really what we wanted to key on is how the family uh, is engaged in the worship and work of the church and how a faithful Christian family will submit itself and subordinate itself to the church. And I have seen, I mean, this, this would be another example of family idolatry, just, just to throw one more example out there. Uh, mm-hmm. I have seen situations where a member of a family has apostatized the elders of the church go to discipline that member of the family, and the entire family decides to leave the church rather right. than have one member of the family subjected to church discipline. Okay, that is idolatry. That's a manifestation of idolatry. It's siding with your family against the church, against the kingdom, against the truth of God. It's choosing family over uh, over God. And so, so that'd be an example of idolatry. A, a family, uh, a, a church, I'm sorry, a family that is church friendly or church centered, we might say, is going to be a church that is going to be a family that is anchored to the ministry of the church, to the worship of the church, that integrates itself into the life of the church. Doesn't mean that church dominates your life, and it doesn't mean the elders are going to be there telling you, you know, micromanaging how you raise your kids or handle your finances or what. It's not that at all. But it is saying that the the family sees its need to be discipled. 
by the ministry of the church. And that's really the key thing is the family puts itself under the authority of the church, submits to the authority of the church so that the family can be discipled by the church. That I think is the key thing. So that, that, that's one, one writing I have uh, with Randy uh, that we did, the church friendly family. I've got another essay, which is an older essay. And I actually meant to go back and read it before we did this podcast. And I did not, I wanted to read it to see how much I still agreed with it. <laughs> I, I, I think I still agree with it. Yeah, uh, but it's called the Church and Her Rivals, hmm. and uh, and I in that essay I talk about how the fan I do at the beginning talk some about sphere sovereignty which we've discussed here, but then I talk about how the family can become a rival to the church, and I, hmm. I deal in particular with uh, the shift that has taken place in the role of the family from old covenant to new covenant because I do think there's a shift in the old covenant. The purpose of the family in Israel is ultimately to bring the promised seed into the world. Uh, to, to keep the seed line going until God sees fit to send Messiah into the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so things like barrenness and childbearing have not only a, a creational role to play, but really a redemptive historical role. Uh, and then with the coming of the new covenant, there, there's, there's, the family is still obviously very important, and we're still to multiply, be fruitful, multiply, and all of that. But the family does have a different place in, in the new covenant uh, order of things. And so I deal with that in that paper uh, I deal with those places where Jesus seems to be speaking out against the family, where he talks mm -hmm. about how the kingdom can divide the family, or he says, you have to love me so much that you hate your mother and father by comparison to be my disciple, those kinds of passages. Deal with all of that. I also deal with the nation, uh, the nation state as a potential rival to the kingdom, which again, the nation's good. Patriotism is good, yeah. but the nation can become an idol. The nation can become a rival to the church. And that certainly happened many times in history. And we need to understand that. Mm -hmm.